Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and on this channel, I offer educational materials on postcolonial theory, literary studies, and sometimes on critical pedagogy. I also occasionally upload videos on political and social issues as mediated through a progressive point of view. Please watch this video till the end and if you like the content and if you like the way I handled the subject then please do consider subscribing to the channel so that you get timely notifications of anything new that is uploaded to the channel. Thank you so much. Hello. Today I will be briefly discussing chapter 2 of Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And my aim here is to give you a brief summary of the main points that Freire discusses in this chapter. Now, please keep in mind that I have a whole series on Pedagogy of the Oppressed where we are reading the book from page one till its end. And uh, we have already covered uh, chapter two and started chapter three, so for a detailed uh, engagement with the text, I highly recommend the series. But in this video, I will just cover some of the main points. Now, if you have looked at the chapter, the chapter starts with a very instructive sentence, and that is, a careful analysis of teacher-student relationship at any level, inside or outside the school, reveals its fundamentally narrative character. Okay, and then he goes on to suggest that education is suffering from a narrative sickness. So if you read the chapter carefully, you will obviously clearly understand that what he means by it, by this narrative character of education is if you keep in mind the structure of a narrative or storytelling, and that is that one person who has the role of telling a story tells the story and everyone passively listens to it. And that is how he is characterizing the existing formal and informal educational system in which the teacher speaks and the student listens. The teacher instructs and the student is instructed, right? And so in this sense, what he is trying to suggest is that the educational system in vogue, which he calls the banking system of education, presupposes the teacher is the holder of knowledge teacher is the agent in the classroom and the students are passive recipients of that knowledge right and then on page 73 in my book he gives you certain main characteristics of the banking system of education now i do have a separate video on the banking system of education which you can watch so i'm not going to delve deeper into it but the basic assumption behind the banking system of education is that it's a top-down educational model in which the students do not have an active role and they are just treated as the passive recipients of knowledge and the analogy is that of making a deposit and that is you go into the bank right and you take your money and you give it to the cashier who takes it away from you and deposits, deposits it for you. And so that's the role of the teacher who has the knowledge, passes it on to students, deposits it in them. And he uh, says that within that paradigm then, at the best, the students can become clerks and cashiers, but they can never become self-thinking individuals. Now, this is deeply connected to the entire philosophy of the book. Remember, what Freire starts with is that the world has an agonistic order, a dichotomy, and the dichotomy is between the oppressors and the oppressed. And that the natural vocation of every human being is to seek their full humanity, right? And the purpose of education is to create a system ed of education in which people are equipped to seek their full humanity. And for that, that oppressive order needs to be changed. The oppressor-oppressed dichotomy needs to be demolished. Similarly here, what he's suggesting is that the teacher-student dichotomy, in which the teacher is in the dominant position, needs to be demolished and replaced with 
what sometimes he calls the libertarian model of education, but as he theorizes it further, he calls it the problem-posing education, right? And that is the second concept this is introduced in this chapter. But this chapter primarily mostly explains the banking system and its ramifications. As we move into chapter three, that's where he will start explaining the problem-posing educational model. Now, there are certain other things um, that he discusses which are associated with the banking system of education in this chapter. And one of those things is that the oppressed, you know, they are not considered beings in themselves, autonomous beings in this model, since they are just considered, you know, passive. So the teacher doesn't even acknowledge that maybe the teacher might learn something from the students. And similarly, in an oppressor-oppressed system, then the banking system not only keeps the students perpetually as objects, but also keeps them entrenched in the dichotomous system of oppressor and oppressed that exists. Because if the students are not thinking for themselves, if they are not contributing to how they ought to be educated, then what you are perpetuating then is right the very system of oppression which is dichotomous. And that's what he's talking about. Now, one ramification of this system of education is if people or students don't learn to think critically of the world in which they live, and the texts have to be connected to that word, then they fall prey to false prophets, right? What's the greatest example of it? Anyone who can come up with certain uh, populist slogans can incorporate them in their project because instead of thinking for themselves and changing the world collectively, they put their trust in these demagogues, in these leaders who uh, appropriate the voice of the people and promise that they will change the world after they have the power. And that means that an uncritical banking system of education then can unleash a public, create a public in which fascism becomes possible. And if you have any doubts about that, don't even look at elsewhere in the world. Just look at the United States and what the populist pol politics have done. When a certain number of people starts believing in this messianic figure who's going to change their lives and give their votes to them, you get someone who absolutely doesn't care about the people, but who will pit you against each other, right? That is the danger of an educational system that produces uncritical human subjects, right? Now, he talks about problem-posing education, right? And basically, what he says is that it rejects this idea that education has to be top-down that it has to be mandated from the top. And I will quote from page 80, he says, the teacher is no longer merely the one who teaches, but one who is himself taught in dialogue with the students, who in turn, while being taught, also teach. So teaching then becomes an act of communication between the students and teachers. The students participate not only as active participants, but the teacher also then creates the kind of curriculum which has content in it, but with that content is infused with the input from the students, but also a content that relates to the world in which students live, right? And so that way, students' engagement in their own learning is increased, right? And then on 81, he says, page 81, he says, the role of the problem-posing educator is to create, together with the students, the conditions under which knowledge at the level of the doxa is superseded by the true knowledge at the level of the logos. So doxa, what is doxa? I mean, anything that is considered immutable, passed down, logos, is when you think, right, word itself. So the purpose then in problem-posing education is to, to change what is considered immutable and only within the grasp of the teacher to something that can be consciously gathered, understood, consumed, and then practiced, right? 
Then uh, some of the main concepts that he talks about are on, on page 84, right, where he concludes what he thinks the banking system is. And he says, in sum, banking theory and practice as immo immobilizing and fixing forces fail to acknowledge men and women as historical beings. Problem posing theory and practice take the people's historicity as their starting point. Let's unpack this. So if you don't take your students as historical beings, then they are the same, right? And you can keep passing down the same information to them and keep pushing it down. But if you make their historicity as a starting point, that means you are living in a certain moment in time, right? And then that historicity also then enables you to see your students within the context of the world in which they live, right? Their own contribution in their own education becomes prominent. And then since they are active agents in their own education, you can go on to change the world, right, as it exists, because you've acknowledged that the students are not passive recipients of your knowledge. And this whole thing is discussed uh, on page 84. And there's another inter interesting sentence there. The banking method emphasizes permanence and becomes reactionary. Problem-posing education, which accepts neither a well-behaved present nor a predetermined future, roots itself in the dynamic present and becomes revolutionary. So you already know what a reactionary order is. A reactionary order is which is trying to forestall change. And the only way you can do that is by continuously producing uncritical human subjects. A revolutionary act, as he would define later in the book, but it is when people are conscious of their lived con conditions, they can think of it critically, and they believe that any knowledge that is passed on to them is not immutable, is, is not doxological, can be changed. And then if they reflect on it and develop a praxis around it, that's when educational act itself becomes revolutionary because it is making sure that students in the process of learning the text or learning the materials are also learning about their life in the world, its injustices, inequalities, but then they're also developing a praxis along with the teacher to change the world, right? And that is what he calls the problem posing education. So overall, in chapter three, we get phrases discussion of the banking system of education, its, its connection to the oppressive order in which there are oppressors and oppressed, its mode as an ideal mode to perpetuate the status quo, right? And its purpose to create non-autonomous, non-thinking human subjects who remain pa passive and unaware of their place in the world, right? And they have no say in their own education. Whereas the problem-posing education that he is introducing here and upon which he concludes the chapter is the kind of education in which students have a say in their own learning. The teacher is dialogic and learns from the student about the material but also about how to teach it. Teaching is conducted in a way where the material that is being taught or discussed is not offered as immutable, where more emphasis is on students coming up with their own questions, challenging the doxa, and re-articulating whatever is being taught, and then connecting it to the world so that they can develop a praxis based in reflection and practice, right? And that's where he's headed in chapter three. Now, I will conclude this on the last paragraph, which I'm going to read and then talk about it briefly. Problem posing as education does not and cannot serve the interests of the oppressor. No oppressive order could permit the oppressed to begin to question. Why? While only a revolutionary society can carry out this education in systematic terms, the revolutionary leaders need not take full power before they can employ the method. In the revolutionary process, the leaders cannot utilize the banking method as an interim measure, justified on grounds of expediency with the intention of later 
behaving in a genuinely revolutionary fashion. They must be revolutionary, that is to say, dialogic from the outset, and that is an insight of extreme brilliance. Okay, and, and what does it say is that you cannot bring, bring about revolutionary change with the modes of old order. You cannot say that we've got this system of education, let's work with it, let's bring about the change, and then we will introduce the problem-posing educational system. Because then you've brought a revolution which will keep intact the power structures that were created by the banking system, right? So what he's saying is that within the process of revolutionary change, the revolution must itself be informed by the problem-posing education because only then you will create the human subjectivities who are not products of an oppressive system but are products of a system of education in which they become thinking, conscious, practicing human subjects. What is at stake here? At stake then, what Freire is constantly trying to teach it is that how do we transform the world in a way that the transform, transformation and those who bring about the revolution themselves do not become the oppressors, which is the biggest problem in Marxism, right? And the only way to do it is to literally create different kinds of human beings who are seeking their full humanity, and as we learned through the readings of chapter one, who are not just liberating themselves, but also liberating their oppressors because the oppressors themselves are dehumanized because of their dehumanizing acts, right? And the only way to do that is not by using the tools of the banking system of education, but by developing the problem-posing education during the early phases of revolution so that the very revolutionaries who bring about the change are a product of the problem-posing educational system. So that's all. That's my summary of this chapter, chapter two. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we are discussing the whole book chapter by chapter, page by page, line by line. So please, please do read the book and do watch those videos. But if you are in a pinch and you just need a summary of the chapter, I hope this suffices and serves your purpose. That is all. Thank you so much for being a part of my life and for joining me. And I am, as always, deeply grateful. And if you have a few moments, please do subscribe to the channel so that you, know, you stay updated about what is coming next. Thank you so much. I will now see you next time. And until then, as always, peace and love.